Hi everyone, I'm Jen Hawes, Partnership Manager for Island Press. I'd like, you to wel I'd like to welcome you today to today's webinar, Saving Our Suburbs, How to Seize Emerging Opportunities. This webinar is the second in a three-part series. Our next webinar will discuss smart suburbs. We have the date and time and the presenters um, still in the works, but you should know that information in uh, the next week or so. Um, if you're interested in seeing part one of this series, it's on the Island Press website um, in our video section. During today's webinar, you'll hear from three panelists that I'll be introducing in a moment, David Dixon, Sarah Woodworth, and Chris Zimmerman. Jason Besky will moderate our discussion. The panelists will be presenting on how suburbs can cover the costs of creating walkable urbanism by being opportunistic and developing innovative public-private partnerships to pay for streets, public spaces, arts and culture, and yes, even parking. In other words, the infrastructure that turns density into a tool for creating community. The webinar today is hosted by Island Press. Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and create solutions to its complex problems. Island Press elevates voices of change, shines a spotlight on crucial issues, focuses attention on sustainable solutions, like we're doing today with this free webinar presentation. I'd like to thank our promoting partners, the Congress for New Urbanism and the American Planning Association's National Capital Area Chapter. Many thanks to the other organizations that help us spread the word about this free webinar today. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you're listening live, you'll be eligible to receive 1.5 AICP CM credits from the American Planning Association. The credits are not available to those who will be listening to the recording. Um, in the next day or two, you'll receive the recording of today's webinar. Feel free to share this as an educational resource across your networks. Um, there are also handouts in this webinar that are in the side panel for everyone's presentations that you can um, utilize. As you have questions, uh, please type them into the questions box um, in the webinar navigation panel. Um, we'll answer as many of your questions as we can at the end um, of the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, we have David Dixon, Sarah Woodworth, and Chris Zimmerman. David Dixon is the Vice President of Planning and Urban Design at Stantex Urban Places. The American Institute for Architects awarded David its Thomas Jefferson Medal for initiating a broad reappraisal of the benefits of walkable density and a lifetime of significant achievement creating livable neighborhoods, vibrant civic spaces, and vital downtowns. Residential Architecture Magazine named him to its Hall of Fame as the person we call to ask about cities. David is co-author of Urban Design for an Urban Century and the co-editor of Suburban Remix, creating the next generation of urban spaces. David plan, David's David leads planning for Stantex Urban Places, an interdisciplinary initiative that helps cities and suburbs become more livable, competitive, equitable, and resilient. Sarah S. Woodworth is the managing member of WZHA LLC. As managing member, Sarah, is, Sarah concentrates primarily on redevelopment strategies, feasibility analysis for various land uses, and structuring equitable financial structures on public-private development projects. In understanding urban redevelopment, Sarah is mostly interested in identifying those competitive aspects of a place that successfully attract people and investment. Sarah has worked on a number of projects that required a full understanding of market and place characteristics in order to conscientiously cultivate opportuni opportunities for mixed-use development and sustainability. In performing redevelopment analysis, Sarah has conducted market analysis, financial feasibility analysis, gap financing identification, and public-private deal structuring. Chris Zimmerman is Smart Growth America's Vice President for Economic Development and Director of the Governor's Institute for Community Design. An economist by training, Chris leads SGA's FTA-funded National Public Transportation Transit-Oriented Development Technical Assistance Program and oversees SGA's program for downtown revitalization, which provides training and technical assistance to local officials. Prior to joining SGA, Chris was intimately involved in planning, developing housing, and transportation policy in Arlington County, Virginia. 
wielding recognized, I'm sorry, wildly widely recognized as one of the leading models for smart growth and transit-oriented development in the United States. During his 18 years as a member of the Arlington County Board, Chris served on many regional transit bodies, including 13 years on WMATA WMATA Board of Tr Directors and 15 years on the Transportation Planning Board for the National Capital Region. Jason uh, and Finally today, Jason Besky will be moderating our webinar. Jason is an urban planner located in the DC region and an adjunct professor at the National Capital Campus of Virginia Tech's College of Architecture and Urban Studies. He has led planning initiatives for corridors, districts, and neighborhoods, typically in suburban communities that endeavor to become more walkable. Community engagement, placemaking, and social equity are the core of his planning and urban design practice. Jason is the co-editor of Suburban Remix, Creating the Next Generation of Urban Places, which examines the rise of walkable urbanism in, in the new suburban era. His current research from the National Association of Industrial and Office Parks reevaluates the redevelopment of retail centers and dead malls. And now I'll hand it over to Jason to get started. Jason? All right. Uh, thank you, Jen. And thank you to our panelists. And also, thank you for everyone for joining us today, uh, particularly those of you who were able to join us in the first part. And as Jen had mentioned earlier, uh, you can view the first part of this series either on Island Press's website or if you go to YouTube, I believe part one is on YouTube. And if you search uh, Saving Our Suburbs, you can find it there. And as always, uh, you can engage with us on LinkedIn if you have any follow-up questions beyond today. But uh, first off, I want to just say uh, the last uh, webinar, uh, urbanist uh, Chris Leinberger joined David and I to discuss how suburbs are building walkable urban places uh, to become more successful, and that's in response to dramatically shifting demographics, a growing knowledge economy, and disruptive technologies. Um, today, uh, we'll hear from the panelists who will really help to demonstrate that there's no single formula for creating walkable urban places in the suburbs, but rather demonstrate the array of tools and anecdotes to do so. Uh, so first off, we're gonna hear from David Dixon. Uh, David will uh, discuss a number of issues. Uh, I think what will be clear out of this is that both the public and private sectors have a fundamental stake in promoting more dense urban places and that there is compelling logic of a shared benefit in doing so. Uh, so David's going to set the stage by, uh, by talking about opportunities, imperatives, and how by working together uh, we can unlock significant value in our suburbs. So I'll hand it over to David. And David, you may want to check if you have your mute button on. Uh, and thank you for saying that, Jason, because I was talking to you all on a muted phone for a minute. Uh, so uh, welcome again to those who are returning, and, and thanks for joining us to those who are uh, joining us for the first time uh, uh, on the second of, of three uh, webinars focused on successful, opportunistic, and smart suburbs. And when we were talking uh, with Chris Leinberger uh, in November, uh, he uh, at one point mentioned uh, that we, uh, the U.S. was basically in the midst of a $35 trillion flow. Oh, that's, that's twice the size, almost twice the size of the U.S. economy, actually, our GDP, uh, from uh, suburbs into cities. This is over a, a, a number of decades. Uh, and um, uh, much of what we're going to be talking about today is the opportunity that this incredible flow of, of, value, of value of wealth has, the opportunity creates for suburbs, also the responsibility uh, of the opportunity creates for urban places, the responsibility of suburbs to basically catch and hold some of this great transfer of, of wealth in suburbs uh, and the opportunities that, that they have when they do this. Uh, and I'm gonna start with a quote that actually comes from a, a gentleman who was, uh, was part of the community that a number of us worked with outside of Roanoke, Virginia, uh, where we were uh, planning with the community to transform a failing mall into a new town center. And he said, oh, I get it. Uh, North America is a suburban continent, but with an urban population today. And that, I think, is at the heart of much of what we're going to talk about. 
Uh, and I'm going to talk about that from a perspective of demographics, of our knowledge economy, and of other fundamentally disruptive changes that are reshaping that we need to manage if we're going to reshape our communities uh, for public benefit in the ways we would like to. And I want to start with demographics because this is at the heart of that $35 trillion flow. Uh, so uh, uh, basically, uh, if you go forward for the next 20 years or more, baked in uh, to our demographics uh, is the reality that that probably more than 80% of all net new households will be singles or couples. Net new households are the folks who buy new housing, buy or rent new housing. Uh, they're the ones that shape markets going forward. What this translates into, and we talked more about this on the first seminar and I'm going to, uh, webinar I'm going to just speak in headlines today, is that basically we're a country where 62% of our housing is uh, currently single family detached in suburbs. Roughly 22% of demand going forward, demand for single family detached houses chiefly comes from households with two adults and kids. Uh, roughly 22% of our net new demand is for uh, single family sub, uh, uh, houses, uh, detached single family houses, um, meaning 78, close to 80% of demand uh, is for urban housing, multifamily, townhouses, houses, housing in walkable, highly amenitized, uh, mixed use places. Uh, this creates a tremendous opportunity. This is what is propelling that $35 trillion. Uh, transfer of, of wealth. It is the fundamental changes in our housing market and where folks want to live now as opposed to where they did uh, 30 or 40 years ago when many of our suburbs formed. Not only that, the wealthier you are and the more educated you are, the more you are seeking to live in an urban place. So while when I grew up, because I'm probably older than just about anybody on this call, this is what our world looked like when you turned on a television. And one thing you will notice is and they're almost always smiling. Kids in every family look at popular media today, uh, and we are very, very <laughs> much more diverse, very different, and representative of a society with our many few kids, many few households with kids. Um, and, uh, and we are a rapidly aging society. And uh, to sort of drive home this point uh, all the way, uh, not only are our demographics changing, but they're actually changing fastest in suburbs. Suburbs are America's popular, more than half our population growth. A major factor in the trend towards a preference for urban housing is the fact that more than half our growth going forward, folks over 65, the most rapidly aging portion of our uh, community, of our, of our society, of our, of, our, of our population, are folks who live in suburbs, um, hence the uh, rapid shifts in demand, uh, in, in particularly in suburbs, away from single-family detached housing, uh, and the opportunity for uh, multifamily and denser urban housing, uh, and as a way to create value. So not only do we have this opportunity, but we have a, a, a fundamental imperative. Uh, the U.S. in two economic development imperative. The U.S. in 2040 will add fewer net new workers than we did in 2010. Uh, right now, uh, we already have this, this, this uh, uh, significant drop in uh, growth in our workforce. It's translating into a, a, a particularly significant shortage of skilled and educated think workers, think knowledge workers. Uh, knowledge workers uh, basically, folks with a college education, if they're between the ages of 26 and 49, prefer uh, uh, strongly to live in an urban area, which means even as urban places are rising, if you've got four years or more of education and you're under the age of 49 you're, and you're more than 26, you're moving into a, a city, into an urban core, less than four years of education, you're moving out. Not necessarily because you want to, but because with income, with education comes income, and more educated folks can afford to live where they want in urban centers. More importantly, here, uh, what's happening uh, is that the jobs and 
investment that represents the growth in the U.S. economy, and our knowledge economy is where our, our significant growth has come from for the last decade and certainly will for the next 20 years, are following these folks into urban places. So uh, the opportunity is tremendous unmet market. Uh, the imperative is if you want a tax base based on anything other than housing, if you, if you want to basically grow in value as a community, you need to invest in the kinds of urban places where value is being created. Um, <clears throat> this is what our workforce looks like going forward. So no surprise, um, these trends have, have been at work for some time. They're becoming highly visible now, uh, but uh, housing prices, city urban housing prices have been rising something like two and a half times faster than suburban prices actually back since 2000. A lot of this change is post coming out of the Great recession uh, starting around 2011, 2012. Um, Interestingly, uh, because um, the kinds of, of industries, jobs that, that, and that uh, really create value, pay rent, um, pay, pay taxes, are, are, uh, are knowledge industries which are moving so rapidly in urban centers, uh, office rents have actually increased eight times as fast in cities as suburbs going back to 2000. Again, uh, much of this dramatic uh, changes are, occurred coming out of the Great Recession. So, so we have this, an oppor fundamental opportunity that we have not had in my lifetime, and that's a long lifetime, an equally compelling imperative. But we also have a series of other highly disruptive changes that are happening rapidly uh, and uh, transforming our, our communities uh, in ways that we want to be able to manage. Um, so. Um, since um, 2000, I think it is, um, suburban poverty has, uh, uh, the number of the folks living under the poverty line in suburbs has increased something like 60% in the U.S. It's probably actually more than that by now because we're past 2015. There's, uh, as urban prices have, have risen faster than suburban housing prices, uh, there's been a dramatic shift of poverty. More poor, poor people now live in suburbs and cities. Um, there are all kinds of moral issues and health issues and, and, and other issues embedded in this, but most immediately, uh, the, most, the, the, the factor to take into, to remember today is when, uh, when your population becomes poorer, the, 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 your cost to operate a community go up. Suburbs need a stronger fiscal base today than they did 10 years ago, and this need will be accelerating due to this rapid shift of poverty, in part, of, of poverty from cities to suburbs. And my, okay. Uh, second, um, I think everyone has heard that Amazon is putting uh, fears and pennies and other big box uh, and, and uh, 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 retailers and department stores out of business. In fact, uh, the chart in front of us to your right basically shows uh, that uh, continuing to 2020 and, and right on as we as we continue forward, um, uh, digital commerce is uh, basically taking significant sales away from brick and mortar retail in most areas, but not food, beverage, uh, brew pubs, uh, not experiential retail. That is holding steady. However, uh, it's not that simple. Um, Restaurants, experiential retail, group pubs, etc., flourish in areas that are dense and walkable. Uh, these are not drive-to forms of retail. They are walk-to. Uh, and so retail is also shifting from drivable suburban, as Chris Weinberger would say, to walkable urban locations. And finally, I doubt there's a person on this uh, listening to this webinar, who has not wondered about the impact of um, autonomous mobility on on how we shape our regions. When Jason and I started uh, to put together Suburban Remix, we had a moment of panic. We thought, oh my God, everyone's going to jump in their Tesla, spend an hour and a half playing computer games, and head out to the suburbs at, or the exurbs at night after work. Uh, talked to my colleagues who are in the autonomous mobility world at Stantec and came to learn that, in fact, the impact will be just the reverse, because it is not the Tesla to the left, it is the shared autonomous vehicle to the right 
that represents the future of autonomous mobility. Uh, shared autonomous mobility will provide lower cost, uh, highly convenient uh, tra transportation on demand in urban places with the density of people and trips to support on-demand service. Uh, in effect, in urban areas, uh, uh, mobility is, is, will be shifting from owned to on-demand in, in um, less dense in, in, in traditional suburbs and exurbs continue to be owned, but owned mobility will be far more expensive and ultimately less convenient than shared on demand. We can talk more about this later. But lest anyone think, gosh, this is off in the future, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we've learned. By the mid 2020s, let's say 2025, that's not far from now, particularly in the planning and development world, 60% uh, of vehicles in the US will have connected technology. That means they probably won't drive you around or me around because we won't have the regulatory framework in place. But what that means is that when you drive up to a parking structure, um, rather than park your car, if you'll excuse me, you will say to your car, go park yourself, and your car will park itself far more conveniently than you or I could have, meaning that we are probably at peak parking today because when our cars start to park themselves, and particularly when 60% of our cars are parking themselves in less than a decade, about 40% of the space in existing parking garages today will become redundant. That, that does not mean we're gonna turn all our parking garages into office space or housing. They, it makes a, they make a lousy, parking makes a lousy version of either, but it means that the parking we've already built will be able to support far more uh, development than it, it can uh, today, uh, and we will begin to be enter into a process of densification and intensification in suburban cores and in, in, in urban cores, suburban centers and urban cores, without the cost of parking and without the obstacle of finding a place to put all those cars. So, what does all this mean for the, the planning that we should be doing, and what is it that we are here today to talk about paying for? What is the infrastructure of walkability, of livability, uh, that is so different from the infrastructure of, of an auto-dominated world that suburbs are used to paying for and providing? Well, let's look at uh, one of the most beautiful suburban images one can imagine, Lake Ann in Reston, Virginia. Um, uh, this, this almost looks like a travel brochure, yet this is the, is the, is the future that Reston envisions for itself. It is it has built a very robust town center because this is beautiful, but this represents the heart of a community, the center of community life uh, that is the future for suburbs. And I want to point out that Reston Town Center, like all of the urban urbanized development suburbia we're talking about, does not involve touching a blade of grass on anybody's front yard. What are the thresholds for success? It starts with leadership, folks who will step forward, uh, Sandy Springs is the most conservative community I have ever met, yet they decided to build something called City Springs because they needed a heart, and their mayor st stepped forward and began the community conversation. It takes transformative planning, uh, which uh, envisions the out of the box, you know, new new places that a community has not imagined, but that the, but but that putting the market to work will allow it to create. It, it's about engaging a community. Uh, in, uh, uh, in every aspect of this discussion. So everybody in the community understands that it's not about changing their, their subdivision, it's about creating a center that enriches all their lives and what this means and how markets and other uh, um, um, aspects of, of what we're talking about actually work. And all this is about uh, laying the groundwork to provide the political support and the community understanding for the kinds of public-private partnerships that will pay for the changes we need. And these changes start with creating walkable places. Uh, <clears throat> walkability is about design and lots of things. This is a new suburban center we're planning just outside of Boston. But more than anything else, they are about density, the density that provides the people uh, the, that support retail and bring life to streets. Density takes innovative approaches to parking, not just shared parking strategy, but most of the time, this may not sound like the most romantic notion, but it takes public sector investment in parking. 
Um, it takes connectivity. Uh, transit does more. I talked about Sandy Springs being very conservative. Sandy Springs had opposed every public investment in transit imaginable in Fulton County and around Atlanta, so outside Atlanta, until they decided to create City Springs, and then they became supporters of public investment in transit. Uh, they also did something that was really important, because it's not just about uh, physical connections, mobility connections, uh, that make a center the heart of community life. It's about locating things that require public investment in the center that make it the heart of, of community life. In Sandy Springs case, a performing arts center that was a, a universal aspiration across that community. Uh, for Reston Town Center, uh, uh, it's about um, a, um, a number of things, but one is an art center this is wonderful. It gives a sense of the culture people can come for, but look at all the people it brings to Reston Town Center. Uh, similarly, Rockville, Maryland, uh, for their center, um, uh, put invested in a public library. This is obviously civic. It's about inclusion. It also drew many of the people in this picture to the town center uh, for the first time and, and continues to draw them. Uh, it's about a public realm where large numbers of people can gather, where one or two people can sit by some water or, or contemplate, uh, have a, a, a very reflect, a very private conversation, uh, and also enjoy the kind of history and authenticity of their community, not because it's a place of architecture, a public realm of, of architecture that mimics a past, but because it's full of the artists and makers who really create what is unique. In this case, this is Mueller, Texas, about um, the, the, the Texas story. Uh, and finally, uh, authenticity, which is probably the most important thing we're going to talk about, is <clears throat> uh, about really making the, the, those who are, who, who are the, uh, the makers of our living community, of our living culture, art, the best chefs, artists, et cetera, part of a place this is a maker's alley in a uh, uh, $3 billion development in Florida. Uh, Belmar, Colorado uh, brought in artists and basically put them in the ground floor of a garage and built some, some gallery space for them. And now 25,000 people come every weekend to see the art and, frankly, to shop and eat in Belmar. And finally, this is uh, from Jason, the example Jason pointed out to me. Uh, the uh, statue there is a uh, fellow named Robert E. Simon, who this, we're back in, in Lake Ann Village in uh, Reston, Virginia, where we were a little while ago. Uh, Robert E. Simon was the founder and developer of Reston. Uh, Jason was strolling through Lake Ann, getting a tour from Robert E. Simon. They walked by this family on this bench, and that girl in that wonderful, in, in all in pink, turned to her, her mom and said, look, mama, that man just got out of his statue. Um, and this is about the authenticity of he, Robert E. Simon, and honor him is, is the authenticity and story of Lake Ann. So thank you. I now will turn the floor over to Sarah Woodworth and then Chris Zimmerman to talk about how we pay for uh, the kinds of environments and places that, that really create the hearts of our communities. Okay. Thanks. All right. Sarah. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, David. And I will uh, intro Sarah. And uh, I think you do make a good uh, case for that imperative of why the why behind uh, walkable urban places in the suburbs. And, uh, you know, one thing I've been seeing in a lot of my work is obviously as planners, we always hear not in my backyard or now yes in my backyard. But, you know, it's, it's these walkable developments aren't instinctively welcomed by these people. But I as as I've been seeing over the years, uh, you know, maybe there's a third subgroup called perhaps in my backyard. So uh, we as planners, as we're going through some of these processes and realizing the imperatives David had laid out, we will need to be sure to communicate the trade-offs and opportunities uh, as we lead intense uh, community conversations. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Woodworth, and Sarah's going to introduce some of the basic implementation tools and how they can be used to transition suburbs to uh, walkable urban places. So, Sarah. Thanks, Jason. Hi, everybody. Um, before I go over the tools that we use to implement, um, I am an economics person, so I deal with the money side of things. Um, I want to just briefly go over what, in my mind, are some of the four basic 
uh, challenges facing uh, investment in the suburbs. And I'm just going to walk through those. Um, first is just the cost of new construction versus what market rents are. And I'm sure many of you who are uh, practitioners out there have faced this. Um, this is an example of some numbers from Kansas City. Um, the, the market rate is $1.75 per square foot per month, which translates into about $1,450 in rent per month. When you take out expenses, that translates into a net operating income of about 11360 bucks. The cost to develop that unit, when you think about land, you think about parking and the development cost of the unit itself, is over $200,000. Now, when we look at investment feasibility or attractiveness of an investment, an easy way to do it is just to look on the back of an envelope at yield. And yield is net operating income divided by development cost. And the question is whether that yield is attractive to an investor. And in this case, in this example, the yield is 5.6%. In the Kansas City market, investors want to see 6 to 7% yield. This project to be feasible would need to have some level of subsidy because market rents are what market rents are. Another challenge facing uh, investment in the suburbs is existing property value versus reuse value. I can't tell you how often I see plans that have taken an old shopping center and have put a nice brand new uh, three to four story residential project on it and the assumption is of course the residential project is a higher and best use economically. But in many, many cases, these strip shopping centers actually don't have any debt and even though they may only be generating $6 in NOI, that land or that property is worth $1.9 million to that investor in this, in this example of a four acre site with a small shopping center on it. When you look at what the market can bear, if developers are only willing and able to pay $12,500 a unit and there are 120 units allowed by zoning, they can only afford to pay that property owner $1.5 million for that strip shopping center. Well, that's not going to work. The property owner isn't going to sell it. So gap funding is often required to actually be able to acquire property to make redevelopment possible. Obviously, uh, parking infrastructure, um, David talked about intensification. If you don't, if, you, if projects aren't feasible because of construction costs, just consider when you add, when you transfer from surface parking to structured parking and that additional $16,000 space or whatever it might be, the economics get very challenging. And a lot of the incentives I'm going to be showing you or talking about today are really about having to help to support uh, funding of structured parking. And then finally, um, this happens in stronger markets, but sometimes land values and existing reg regulations don't jibe. I used the example of the Strip Shopping Center earlier, where that property owner thinks that property is at least worth $1.9 million. And if the zoning was limited to only 30 units per acre, then the zoning itself, because the zoning envelope is too low, can't generate sufficient land value to actually buy that property out. So sometimes we have to look at zoning and lifting the envelope to create an attractive in, uh, investment opportunity. So just one quick consideration um, when you're dealing with the de economics of development, rent is hugely important. And in your communities, the development costs are probably pretty much the same in different neighborhoods in your community, but rents can be quite different. This is Alexandria, same product, rents are 10% different and they're because they're in different neighborhoods. So I, um, I suggest that you get really, um, you do your due diligence on rent when you think about public policy and you think about public private investment. So some of the incentives that we use a lot, many of you know about these, but, um, um, one is tax abatement. Uh, property tax abatement is most normal. Um, the term of the abatement really depends upon the market and the property tax burden. The property appreciation um, should be able to catch up to the property tax obligation over time so that the schedules, the abatement schedules should be aligned with the realities of the marketplace. Um, you can do abatement for specific uses to incent specific uses. Often property tax abatements are just um, policies like they're as of right in certain areas they don't necessarily require that the project demonstrate that it wouldn't work financially without the property tax abatement sometimes you do but sometimes you don't um, there are all kinds of property uh, excuse me tax abatements they could be hotel taxes recording fees anything like that um, but property tax is the most um, normal 
this just goes back to our base example where if you've got a property tax abatement, you notice that now that property um, looks like a much more attractive investment opportunity to the private investor. Now, of course, they will look at um, returns over time with a pro forma, but property tax abatement is something that we use very often that, um, to help unlock development potential in the suburbs. This is an example of Albany, New York, where um, our, my company worked with them to put together their schedules. The point I want to make here is abatements can be for a very long time, and the reason they're so long in Albany is because they have a huge property tax burden in New York State. Tax credits. Um, tax credits provide equity and reduce investment exposure. There are tax credits out of the federal government, out of the state government, and sometimes through local um, municipalities. Um, the most common or most powerful ones are low-income housing tax credit, the historic tax credit, new market tax credits, which are all coming out of the federal um, um, government. And to just give you an example, if we go to our base scenario, let's just assume that the base scenario was an historic renovation project. And let's just assume that part of our development costs, we were able to sell historic tax credits. And you can see on the right side that the historic tax credit equity reduces the developer's um, exposure to cost from $203,000 to $176,000. And now that return or, or yield increases to be within the threshold green area. These, these tax credits are hugely valuable and, and are appropriate and available at, in, in some suburban locations where there are older older buildings. Just another quick example, I'm not gonna go into this in much detail, but it's something we recently did in Sparrows Point, Maryland, where we actually used an, a, a tax credit abatement by the state, and the county basically gave a portion of that to the developer to help fund um, infrastructure development, um, a creative way of using a tax abatement from the state to the county. Now, opportunity zones are things that you've heard about, and um, we're still waiting for the IRS to give some clarification, but these are not tax credits. This is the opportunity zones are about deferring taxes to investors. Um, the whole idea um, in our world is that in opportunity zones, the theory is that because of the tax benefits to the investor, um, investment hurdle rates will likely drop in projects in opportunity zones. So, for example, under our base case scenario, remember how we had a threshold of six to seven percent yield. That may that yield might be five point five percent to six point five percent if it were in an opportunity zone. Tax increment financing is something that is used across the country. It's really been a successful tool for um, revitalization and reinvestment. The idea is you lock the existing tax um, base at a given point in time and any new incremental taxes generated by new development are actually reinvested either into the district and or into a project. So TIF can be project-based or district-based. Um, we use TIF a lot for structured parking and infrastructure investment in the suburbs. Um, typically, if it's a project-based tax increment financing deal, you need to show that without the tax increment financing, that gap funding, that the project wouldn't work, that it wouldn't be financially feasible. And this way, the community recognizes that they really haven't lost anything by giving up the future tax increments for a specified period of time, because they wouldn't have gotten them anyway. Um, TIF can be used both, um, can be bonded, and it can also be used on a pay-as-you-go basis. A great example of TIF is a project that David and I um, both worked on. We actually were there in 2009 to help this suburban community of Columbus think about a plan to help them to create a mixed-use office residential retail environment because they thought they needed it to be competitive for the office market as, as um, the market was evolving. So a plan was um, was created. And then in 2000-2014, I think Crawford Hoying, a local developer, actually took that plan and made a plan for investment. And in, as you can see above, um, the initial phases of that project have been built. And key to the success of that project called the Bridge Park um, was a commitment by the city for um, a TIF money to, to support the roads in, um, associated with that project as well as two parking garages. Right now, office parks for free and structured parking in this project. 
special assessment districts. Um, this is, these are districts where there's an additional tax put on property owners to pay for um, either uh, programs and or infrastructure. There are two types of special assessment districts. One's a voluntary district and the other one is a government imposed district. Voluntary districts are when property owners, a majority of the property owners in a given geography agree to have a special tax to help pay for things like safety, marketing, infrastructure. These voluntary districts typically happen in medium to strong markets because they've got to have enough, um, they have to be willing to pay the extra tax. Um, in government imposed district, the, dis the governments impose the special tax to help pay for generally infrastructure. The benefit of an assessment district is that they provide a reliable and stable source of revenue, which means you can bond off them very easily. The capital markets are very receptive to that kind of money. Um, just two quick examples, a volunteer, oriented title um, special assessment district we did in North Potomac Yard because the property owner um, was going to gain a lot if they got a trans transit station so they agreed to have a special assessment to help fund it um, so there was a win-win there on a government imposed um, example in Tyson's Corner the uh, property owners had already agreed to special assess themselves to to fund metro but then the the county came back and said we need additional taxes to support roads and they impose the the road special assessment district on top of those property owners um, and then finally regulation this is this concept that i think really happens more in strong markets than weaker suburban markets but basically, the zoning really has to be thinking about economics of redevelopment. And in this case, as you can see, if under our base case scenario, had there been 40 dwelling units per acre and allowed by zoning, um, the uh, developer may have been able to buy that, um, that shopping center because he would, there, it would make sense to the shopping center owner because they'd have $2 million and the shopping center owner thinks there's $1.9 million of value there. A great example of this was in the White Flint plan, where we had to, um, the property owners, um, the, the community was all about mixed use and walkable, but they were also very concerned about traffic. But the idea was in this very powerful suburban location where there were a lot of strip shopping centers, the plan had to provide enough zoning envelope to incent the property owners to redevelop their properties. And so we, we demonstrated to the community that certain levels of floor area ratio, which is essentially intensity of use, had to be hit for actually to, to realize what they wanted, which was higher density, mixed use walkable. As it turns out through this kind of communication with the community, they did allow for higher FARs than they may have initially thought they were gonna go after. So finally, um, in summary, understanding redevelopment economics is really important as an underpinning to public policy and also um, successful implementation. Public-private development and financing are typically necessary when we look at redevelopment in the suburbs, and it is not uncommon to engage multiple incentives, in other words, a bundle of the ones I've just presented, to obtain desired results. And with that, I think I turn it back to Jason. Yep, Thanks. I'm here. All right, uh, thank you, Sarah, uh, for that, uh, the framework and the tools, appreciate that. And it should help um, as we transition over to Chris's piece. Uh, today, Chris is going to uh, describe the major elements of emerging walkable suburbs and the different types that exempl exemplify the trend. Uh, he will uh, talk quite a bit about Arlington and his experiences there using that. And I wanted to mention, I had a uh, had pleasure to work with Chris uh, while I was in Arlington uh, and he was on the board and I was on planning staff and there were a number of projects um, that he was able to shape in the community. I wanted to mention one, if you joined us on part one, I had gone over the urban design framework in walkable suburbs and used an example from Crystal City and Pentagon City in Arlington. And uh, we have found out subsequently after that first webinar that uh, Amazon's HQ2 indeed is locating in that exact location, so uh, it should make for an interesting case study as we move forward. But I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Chris, and I will remind attendees, if you do have questions, please get them in now because we're going to start the Q&A uh, right after Chris's piece. I have a handful, and I'd like to see uh, more if you are interested. So, Chris. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I think the uh, mention, <coughs> excuse me, the mention of the um, 
Crystal City Plan and Amazon HQ2 is particularly apt, although it's not in my presentation today, um, because it, it emphasizes one of the points that I want to make, which is that uh, a lot of the uh, things that make development attractive, uh, you know, many of them are financial, but uh, a lot of it is regulatory, and I think we should not uh, underestimate that. And in the case of Crystal City and the Amazon HQ2 decision, I think a large part of it was the fact that the plan that Jason was talking about really facilitates the kind of thing that Amazon wants to do. And I think that's part of the reason why, although there are some tax incentives involved, the tax incentives for the Virginia location are vastly smaller than what was proposed by other communities that were bidding, notably are just across the river uh, in, in Maryland, where they offered about 10 times as much in tax subsidy. So um, with that as kind of a precursor, um, let me uh, talk about a few things. Um, the, um, the, the, I wanna start kind of where Sarah uh, began and uh, the, the issues of the challenges that she mentioned with doing suburban redevelopment that are you know, fundamentally economic. Um, and a couple of them, uh, about three, the first three of her four things were, were really financially, directly financial, but they all go to the economics of the project. And these are addressed in different ways in different projects around the country. Um, but, but fundamentally, you're either looking to lower the cost of the developer uh, through a number of you know, various kinds of means, which can be done by giving them some kind of tax subsidy or by some kind of direct public investment, uh, such as, for instance, taking the, you know, investing in the parking. Uh, or, or raising the value so that there's a higher return to be gotten. And that can be done a number of different ways, for instance, by direct public investment in something that isn't necessarily part of the project, but say a transit system uh, that raises the, the rent that they can potentially gain. And then, then there's this question of adjusting regulations. And this is what I was just referring to, because I don't think that should be underestimated. It does include things like zoning that uh, Sarah pointed to uh, and the density it's allowed, but it can be more involved than that because a lot of our regulations can facilitate and point to the kind of development we want. Uh, for the most part, the, the zoning that exists in every suburb in America pretty much does not get you the kind of stuff we're talking about. So it's basically we have the wrong regulations in place almost everywhere. Uh, and then there's other regulatory issues like how hard is it to do this kind of thing uh, when we uh, look at uh, processing uh, you know, the, the approvals, even after you have uh, something that's legally entitled, uh, you can have a very convoluted process that can be discouraging to uh, investors. So, you know, these are things that, uh, you know, we have to look at. And I think that when you see some of the examples, they all reflect addressing, you know, kind of each of these concerns. Uh, many of them, they'll fall in the last category. Uh, I believe David said that, uh, you know, they're, they're, these things are unique. Um, there's not one way to do it. Um, but there are principles that apply wherever you're trying to do this. Uh, and in particular, um, these three things. If you're looking to make a suburb, which is fundamentally a sprawling place, uh, you know, with lots of uh, distance between activities, uh, and in a sense, no center, uh, the first thing you have to do is create new centers, um, activity centers that, uh, that are walkable, that have activities that can be in walkable distances so that you can make it possible for people, even those who are going to drive there, to, to drive and park once. Uh, secondly, they have to be mixed. Uh, you know, again, our suburban patterns are basically uh, driven by, by zoning that separates retail and residential and, and, and work functions and so on. These have to be mixed uh, in close proximity. And then thirdly, they really have to be walkable, and that goes to the issue of design. And that's why, again, a lot of the regulatory issues are really important because uh, you, you need density, but you don't get them just by, by allowing density. You have to make sure they're designed right, both in the public and private spaces. Unfortunately, a lot of our suburban places look kind of like this, uh, and they're, you know, they're not really places, and uh, they're not particularly walkable, even if, as in this case, uh, you have a, an actual sidewalk that somebody put there. Uh, that nobody particularly wants to walk on. At the same time, you know, it, it, getting these walkable places really is about designing them properly. So again, you need density, you need use mix, and you have to have good urban design. Building the infrastructure for, um, for walkability is important, but you know, a sidewalk by itself, no matter how nicely it's done and lit and all that, doesn't mean you have a walkable environment. If uh, you, know, you don't have the right building envelope next to it, if you're not creating the street wall, 
uh, then you don't have a walkable place. I want to talk about a few, some examples of places that were done that exemplify, I think, the basic principles, um, but also utilize a variety of different tools. And, and again, emphasizes one of Sarah's point, which is frequently, this is not one kind of tool that you know opens the whole thing up. It's very frequently a, a wide mix of of, uh, of tools, um, some kind of package that's put together. Uh, that makes uh, particular developments possible. Uh, this is sort of a, a rough typology. Uh, I'd say that places that uh, have looked at this in, in suburban context can be divided into those that are looking at a corridor and those that are uh, working on specific centers. So on the corridor side, we have kind of two kinds. One is the corridor that was pretty much an old town, uh, that, that pretty much was uh, an, a pre-car Carter. In other words, uh, before 1950, a lot of them with these were along streetcar lines, and so they they usually have some old town centers uh, along their way. Now, many of them then got left behind as uh, after World War II, and everybody got automobiles, and we moved to the you know the farther out suburbs. Um, those were often abandoned, and then we got new auto oriented strips that are basically buildings with parking lots around them, strip shopping centers, and things like that. Uh, so some of the approaches have been to try and deal with a whole corridor. Uh, and then there are the uh, specific town centers, which there's probably more examples of, where you have these suburban uses, again, mostly single purpose, uh, malls that are failing, strip shopping centers, and office parks. And in, in many cases, people are looking at those for the opportunity to create uh, a new center, a new downtown, in effect. Now, it happens that uh, my own uh, community of Arlington, Virginia, as mentioned, uh, has uh, examples of at least three of these types, so I'm going to touch on those. Um, the two types of corridor renovation I mentioned, you know, you, you kind of have both of it here in, here in Arlington. So the first one, uh, the Roslyn Boston corridor is an example of the former. Uh, the second one, uh, the Columbia Pike corridor I'll talk about is more of the latter. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk just briefly about the Roslyn Boston corridor. This is the one that is in, uh, uh, there's a lot more detail about in chapter 12 of the book that Jason and, and David edited, uh, if you want more details. Um, but it's basically a, a place that was, there was a line here that was at one time, you know, an old uh, kind of car commuter rail line. And there were a few little uh, centers along it, but it was pretty much um, abandoned by the, the 1940s as a place of economic growth. Um, it, this became a bedroom community, uh, which didn't really have a strong uh, economic center or base uh, for, for taxes really uh, in, until the, uh, up through the 70s uh, when the metro system came in. And uh, the key move here was the decision that unlike in other suburban areas, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the train would not be running entirely above ground in the, high, in the median of a highway, but would go underground uh, to uh, create the possibility. So it would be a subway through uh, this corridor, and uh, that would create the possibility for a uh, you know an urban development. Uh, this was quite a, a great deal of foresight in the people in the 60s and 70s who figured this out and made that investment. Um, and and the, the principal point here is that this was the main thing that was done on the on the government spending side, which was to invest in this big piece of infrastructure. Uh, the other thing that was done was essentially regulatory. If you see those black lines around the uh, five station areas. Those are areas that were defined, each of which was given and has to this day a sector plan uh, that essentially facilitates the development. Uh, those are the main things that were done to make this possible. So back in the 70s, having decided they were going underground, they picked the, what they call the bullseyes and said, we're going to concentrate development there. And then they put in a place, a, a regulatory scheme that would do it. Um, this is notable because they did almost nothing else of the conventional things that you associate with uh, this kind of redevelopment. In other words, there wasn't a tax subsidy, there was no TIF, uh, a lot of those kind of things that have been done, no incentives. And in fact, even much of the public infrastructure like the sidewalks were paid for by the development, by the developers themselves. That was part of the requirement. So the, the main point here is they raised the value of the land drastically by, create, by investing in the subway. And then they facilitated high density development, um, but withheld the approvals until you know a flight plan came in that would uh, conform with the sector plan. Uh, and that had quite a result in you know, a place that was you know back in the 60s, uh, Roslyn looked like this. Uh, you know after uh, the 
train went through and the plan was implemented, you know, it became a big downtown. Uh, you know, much of the corridor was essentially car oriented. Um, and now it's mixed use development. Uh, this is an old Sears that was in what was really the old, the closest thing to a town center that the county had really, uh, but was very much auto oriented. And uh, now again is mixed use development. And it's a very walkable environment. Uh, when the train stations first went in, they were just, you know, <laughs> just escalators in the ground popping up in a place with not much development. Um, but that changed over the course of several decades. I, I would note here, this is two stations, actually, Boston and Virginia Square. And you see that, excuse me, the uh, development hugs around the station, according to the plan, and tapers away from it. So the vast majority of the land is actually still what it was before in essentially a low density suburban condition. But these metro stations, seven stations, produce half the uh, tax revenue the county receives. So, you know, again, here's one in Boston, 1980. You see the station, lots of undeveloped land. And then uh, 20 years later, uh, here is mixed use development all around uh, the station. Uh, there was, of course, the old shopping mall that had uh, surface parking. It even declared itself in its name that there was lots of parking. Here's the same spot if you went and stood there today. With one exception, I took this picture a couple years ago. On the right, you'll see some cars there. That was the last remaining car dealer at this intersection. And that is actually now a building that is under construction. So uh, again, this became a new urban downtown over a period of decades from uh, essentially a mass, one massive public investment and a lot of uh, regulatory action to facilitate the development. Now, on the other hand, uh, in the south part of the county, there is an area that uh, is, looks an awful lot like every other auto-oriented strip in the country, or it certainly did uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and this did not have the kind of uh, public investment to generate that sort of development uh, just simply by permitting it. Um, and so a lot of effort was made, not so much on, uh, you know, incentives of the tax side, but to really trying to facilitate uh, on the regulatory side, uh, which was largely done through a form-based code to facilitate development at a smaller scale, but higher density than was there now, um, and transform places that were essentially, again, you can see post-war auto-oriented strips um, and, you know, shopping centers with parking lots because uh, that's what it looked like um, just a few years ago uh, into these new mixed-use centers, uh, including those with public spaces. This is actually the parking lot that was in front of that grocery store, uh, which is now public property uh, deeded uh, as per the plan uh, to the county. Again, the main uh, incentive here was a facilitating code that made it uh, much easier to gain approval and uh, allowed, relaxed a lot of the restrictions on the zoning uh, that have made it uh, you know, viable to do in this market. Now, you know, the code pays attention to a lot of things, and this is some of the benefits. The backside of the shopping center used to look like that. Uh, transitions to neighborhoods being really important. Um, that's what they now face, and, and, and that's obviously income producing property, but it's also an improvement for the neighborhood. Uh, we had abandoned shopping centers, or grocery stores, I should say. Um, I should also say that we didn't really have pedestrians, and these people you see in this picture from 2002 were actually photoshopped in for the purpose of uh, our planning exercise. Um, but now we have uh, residents and, and retail on the ground floor and uh, actual pedestrians. So um, that is uh, an example of you know, what can be done with regulation. Now here's another one, and this one has a little bit of public money in it because this is affordable housing, but this is a former gas station site, and you can see not really very pedestrian oriented. There's a very narrow sidewalk uh, and, of course, much curb cut. Uh, after the gas station went away and new building went in, you have a much better uh, public, uh, you know, public realm. And in this case, unlike in the Metro Carters, that's largely paid for, an awful lot of this is paid for by the county. Um, and uh, the, the building is actually affordable housing, so it does have some county housing money in it. But uh, basically, it's a, a tax paying piece of property with five stories of retail. Uh, five stories of residential over retail and a much enhanced walking environment. So uh, that gives you an idea. Uh, again, those uh, involve limited um, tax uh, kind of measures of the types that are talked about. The others I'm talk that I'm going to show uh, have a little bit more of that. Uh, and these ones uh, happen to be kind of you know focal points where a particular site, sometimes under one ownership, is converted, which often facilitates it. Uh, and uh, in some cases, they're you know they're older examples. I'll start with one in particular. 
that is one of the oldest uh, cases I know of, maybe the oldest case of a of a shopping mall being reconverted into a, you know a town center. Um, this is one that was in Boca Raton, Florida, and uh, in you know in the 1970s it was a conventional suburban shopping mall, uh, fully enclosed and all that, anchor department stores, that all the things that that uh, go on with it. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the the anchor stores closed uh, in 1989, and uh, so it was no longer producing revenue for anybody or, or tax revenue for the county, or for the city. And uh, they had really no down, no much downtown presence. Presence uh, only about three housing units, uh, low office rents, and so on. And so they wanted to turn that around, and they essentially turned this, they leveled them all, and turned this into. Uh, a, a mixed-use place with uh, residents over uh, shops and so on. And uh, in this case, this is, I, as I said, I think the, the earliest example I know of uh, where this was successfully done. Uh, they closed the mall in 89, uh, and Meisner Park, the, the new development, opened in the early 90s. Uh, it's 30 acres, which is a good size for a catalytic development in a suburban context, I would say. Uh, it has you know shops and uh, 40 shops, uh, 260,000 square feet of office space, over 270 residential units, and uh, of course, nice public realm. Uh, this was done, a lot of it with investment in infrastructure. The city approved uh, bonds uh, that could support the infrastructure uh, for all these public spaces that were created. Uh, the result had been that uh, property values rose and uh, it's been a successful place. Uh, on an even bigger scale and somewhat more dramatically, in uh, Lakewood, Colorado, west of Denver, and I think uh, David mentioned this in his presentation, uh, there was a mall called Villa Italia that was one of the biggest in the country in the 1970s, close to a million square feet, I think. This is a site of over 100 acres, which is really a size for a pretty good downtown. Um, but you know, as you can see, it's mostly about the parking. Uh, and it was real successful and the main tax base for an otherwise residential community for a long time uh, until it failed. And it went from being very successful to failing very quickly, as many of these malls have. And uh, by the early 1990s, um, it, it was really in trouble and it closed. And uh, the city, the, the county rather, I'm sorry, uh, Lakewood, um, needed to do something about this because they, they didn't have a, a tax base essentially. So it closed in 2001 and um, then they, uh, made a deal with a, a development entity in order to um, redevelop the whole property as a new downtown. They established several districts uh, to uh, assess for the financing and the operation and the maintenance of the public side. They uh, the, they issued bonds and levied um, taxes within the commercial and, and residential districts that were established so as to cover about 60% of the cost of public improvements uh, through public bonds. The developer paid about 40% of them, so it is a partnership. There's, it uses a TIF and a public improvement fee to support the revenue bonds that they issued, uh, and as a result, they were able to turn this into uh, a, real, a real place, uh, which uh, it now has a grid of streets and is a, a town center. So on the left, you can see essentially the largely parking and single structure nature of the mall replaced on the right with a grid of streets and many other buildings. Uh, one other example of this even more recently is in Northern Virginia where in Fairfax County, uh, there was a, uh, a drive-in movie theater that became a, uh, uh, a closed-in multiplex cinema when drive-ins uh, became less viable and then the multiplex cinema closed. And uh, so they had a, you know, an, an, a largely empty site, much of which, of course, is devoted to parking. Uh, and in the late 2000s, uh, began planning for a, a different future for it to try to create uh, a place that was uh, more reflective of the market that we now have that David was talking about. Uh, so this starts with a place that had space for a thousand cars, um, and now it's a place that has. Uh, mixed uses, uh, a range of different activities, public spaces, parks, and that kind of thing. And as you can see on the left, this is where the, th the theater was, surrounded by an awful lot of asphalt. Uh, that was just uh, a few years back. And here in 2002, you see it almost built out. And this picture is uh, three years old now. Several of these sites have actually been built. Uh, so there are now, um, there are now actually uh, buildings on those as well. Uh, but this is another thing accomplished through uh, a mix of approaches, including a TIF and uh, a, a community development uh, agreement, uh, a community development authority, uh, working with the developer to uh, sort of jointly finance and um, facilitate the creation of the public spaces. 
uh, with about, I think about $42 million went to public facilities on the site, like road improvements, parks, and uh, a portion of the parking garage uh, through a, a bond that was issued by the CDA. Uh, there's uh, again TIF used to create uh, created to to uh, pay debt service, uh, and through that mix uh, they created something that has about a thousand units of housing and townhouses and apartments, uh, 170,000 square foot uh, store, and then another half million feet or so of full retail at build out, uh, a movie theater, a hotel with 148 rooms, office space, uh, a park I mentioned, and so on. So. Again, a mixed use center in a place that didn't have one. Uh, the last one I'm gonna touch on is uh, again in Arlington. This is a 1940s era shopping center that was basically one block. It was 1940s, so these stores had two entrances. They had the one block had entrances of the old fashioned kind. Uh, and then in the back, they had lots of parking. So this is a look down, you can see it's right next to a highway. Um, and it had uh, essentially this one block in the middle and a big box that folded sometime back. So everything you see in red, was basically surface parking uh, until just a few years ago. Uh, this is where it evolved by 2010, where most of that surface parking, uh, almost all except for one lot, has become buildings um, with, again, a pedestrian-oriented environment um, with all the other elements we've talked about, uh, active on the street, residential over retail. And in sum, uh, there's a grocery store, there's a thousand residential units, 300,000 square feet of retail, 600,000 feet of office. There's a, a public library, uh, a movie theater, a live theater, uh, a hotel with 106 rooms and so on. And this is all on a side of about 26 acres uh, that's right next to a highway. So it emphasizes that you can do an awful lot in a small amount of space. Um, this is a look from the air. So everything you see here in the foreground was parking lot up until a few years ago. The key part of the public partner, private partnership here, if you see in this, this center here, this, this parking garage, the, this area to the right is county land that is used for servicing. It's the, all the utility functions of the, of the county. And a deal was made to swap some of that land so that this garage could be created, that walkable space is on the other side. This is a park once kind of thing. You can drive in, park your car, get out, and do everything you're going to do. If you're not one of the people who lives there, go to the library, go to the theater, go to the stores, whatever. Uh, and so th this garage was a key part. Another part of it was the moving a public library to the center of it. So that's government expenditure on something that's a public uh, you know, public service, but the developers wanted another anchor. And so the county's providing one of the anchors by putting a library there. And another one was the theater, which is a live theater, a nonprofit group supported by the county. They built the theater uh, for the for the organization and um, and continue to support the theater group. So there's, there's public elements in it. Uh, and of course, a master plan that facilitated this type of development on what was formerly mostly uh, parking lots. Uh, I would say about Bridge Park, which was mentioned earlier, this is chapter 11 in the suburban mix. Um, it's an example of places that have are dependent on an awful lot of office in a suburban context, looking to what they can do. Uh, this is uh, a new downtown basically being created amidst uh, what was, was very successful uh, 20th century office parks. Uh, this, there's similar efforts in, in underway in other places, notably uh, in North Carolina in Research Triangle Park. Uh, and with that, I think I'll stop and uh, turn things back over to Jason. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, great exploration of a lot of what's happening out there. And I'm going to uh, jump into questions. And I got a lot. I, I wasn't meaning for everybody to send me a question when I asked for questions, but <laughs> we, have, uh, we have a lot of good ones. Um, I did get a lot, and I'm going to go ahead and turn on my webcam so you can be interactive with this. So uh, again, thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with one question, uh, and this is for the group, and it says, uh, can you speak to the challenges of implementing higher density uh, TOD in an evolving suburban market? Uh, by that, the uh, individual means uh, no existing density or an un unclear market. Uh, and then what are the critical initial elements that would uh, stimulate later phases? Uh, this is David. I will I will venture in. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, we are committed to all of you. This, this is not necessarily an inducement to type more questions and send them to Jason, but we are committed to answering all the questions, whether we have time uh, during this uh, webinar or not. So we will follow up in email if we haven't answered. Uh, uh, I'm going to say that um, one of the things that uh, I've learned from Sarah, but also uh, Lori Volk, who 
is I think the preeminent analyst of uh, changing and emerging housing markets, which is, and housing again, is the market that is most likely to drive the kinds of changes we're talking about because it is so uh, urban, mixed use, walkable housing markets are so underserved. Uh, and we have such a pronounced shift in our demographics um, that um, uh, it is really worthwhile to do a, a uh, 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 this is a pitch, I guess, for Lori's firm, Zimmerman Vogue, to do a really good housing study, not based on cops, where when you're out in a greenfield or an area that hasn't had anything like what you're doing, there are no cops, but to really, uh, a housing study that drills down into the demographics that we've been talking about and unearths, brings up uh, a the market that can probably be the foundation for this uh, development, and then in case uh, and then and then if you can get about a thousand units of housing within a five minute walk of of a of a main street, you can bring a main street to life, which is the the mix that that Chris talked about is so critical to all the examples he talked about, and certainly the work that Sarah and I have done together is is equally true, um, and. Um, and then in case politics is on our dear listeners' mind, uh, one of the things that we love to talk, always talk about folks with is, um, well, Sarah t talked about really making transparent how much density is required to unlock an opportunity, so people know that. But on the other hand, ask people, if someone's gonna come in and spend 100 or 200 or $500 million in your neighborhood, what do you want? What would make this a better place to live? Sarah, do you have some comments? Or Chris? Well, I'll jump in just real quick, and I um, I really agree with David as I, this gets to my sort of rent point, which is really understand the economics of trying to get that kind of development to happen. And um, by doing that, there are two things that it should lead to. Is One is public policy that supports it and putting the tools together to actually make that kind of development happen. In other words, find that public-private sweet spot, um, and that Will, that will then um, inure sort of trust by the development and private investment community. And I also will say that the plan, which I think Chris really said really well, how important the vision is and having that, having the, the government really support that vision and be committed to it, um, both in terms of not only public policy, but, but money. Yeah. Chris, we don't see you up here, but do you have some comments? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, second most of what uh, you and Sarah said, uh, particularly that second point um, about what you're trying to get out of it. I think one of the things you have to bear in mind, uh, particularly if you, if you find it necessary to incentivize at the beginning, the key should be at the beginning. So, you know, there are places where the market is basically strong, and if you put the right kind of policies in place, the right kind of regulations, uh, create the right environment, then it should drive itself. There are places where that doesn't happen and doesn't won't work, uh, and you would need to make up the gaps that Sarah talked about. But I, I, I mean, I'm an economist by training, so my bias is immediately to say, why are we paying to cover that gap? I mean, is there a reason why we should be, you know, not just saying, well, this is the market? And and the answer, there may be very good, compelling reasons for that. Uh, but once we've taken our regulatory obstacles, once government's gotten out of the way, is there still a gap? If there's a gap, then you need to ask yourself. If we, if we cover it for one, if we create a catalytic project, a project, will that prime the pump? Will that get something going that will then be on its own? And I think you need to believe that or it's not clear why you're doing this. So those are important questions to ask when you're looking at what you're going to put into it and what you hope to get out of it. And this, this is such a good question. As a quick postscript to what, what Chris and Sarah said, uh, there's a brilliant fellow named uh, Terry Fogler who was the the leader who stepped forward in Dublin, Ohio, uh, ultimately made Bridge Park happen, the example that Sarah mentioned, alluded to, and that Chris finished with. And uh, Sarah and I and, and some of my colleagues were lucky enough to the privilege of being the consultants who worked for a couple of years uh, uh, with the good folks of Dublin to create Bridge Park uh, or create the, create the foundation. What Terry did was launch a year-long, really intensive community engagement around Cradia Town Center. This is a profoundly suburban community. And the reason he did this, he wanted people to understand, he wanted support, but what he really wanted support for, understanding of, and therefore support for, was the $300 million that the city of Dublin invested in the $1 billion project that is Bridge Park. 
He needed public support, strong community, not support, enthusiasm for community investment that was essential to unlock the opportunity there. David, I would just add, you know, the, uh, I think what you just said is important for almost all of these that are successful. There, there aren't very many successful examples that don't involve great deal of community engagement because you've got to have people ready to accept change which is not an easy thing and often to make an initial investment and, and certainly in Arlington's case all the system from having the citizenry on board from the beginning and understanding that we're making a deal here and we're going to get some things out of this and that's why we're going to not only have a plan but stick with a plan as elected officials like myself come and go. Thank you. Jason, we can't hear you. You saw me. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, has there been uh, a way for the parking garages in these developments uh, to pay for themselves, or are they subsidized somehow? So parking. Sarah? In, in most, I mean, when we get into the hot markets like the D.C. market, maybe they can pay for themselves. But I would say that in, if we're talking about suburbs across America, you're probably looking at subsidizing parking garages. Um, it's more the norm. And that's why public-private investment is often required to, um, to, do, to do suburban redevelopment with parking garages. I mean, sometimes parking garages that changes over time. Sorry, sir. And and certainly sometimes sometimes it does change over time. But I mean, I think that the uh, you know a low cost parking space per you know for a parking garage is sixteen thousand. If you go underground or do anything like that, you're going to be dealing with forty thousand. So it's a lot of money. And think about what the monthly rates are in normal um, suburban communities. They're not even used to paying for parking. So we often in suburbia, normal American suburbia, not hot hot market suburbia. Um, are looking at subsidizing parking that doesn't pay for itself. And I think that's a difficult thing uh, for a lot of folks to understand. Uh, in our area, underground parking is fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a space, uh, and we have in you know both examples of parking where there's demand and you can and should charge, and places where the demand is not quite there and the you know the the businesses will be very unhappy if you start charging you know for parking, um, and. The, the difficult thing is to both to understand that you may have a period, and it could be a long period, where you need to maintain free parking, not because that's a smart thing to do overall, but because you live in a reality of there's free parking all around you and you're competing with that. Uh, yep. But also be prepared for a transition. So, you know, I gave the example of Sherlington, which has had uh, free parking as opposed to uh, you pretty much pay to park in the Metro corridors. And in, in Charlington for, for years, there was no, there was parking was free on the street too. And the county eventually went into metering and uh, the, there's been a, an intention to shift ultimately to charging for parking in garages as it's viable. Um, that's, you know, it's, it's not quite there yet, but that's, you know, that's the idea is that when there's the demand there and when you, you know, need to start regulating the, you know, the allocation of that resource, uh, then you should price it. Um, but, you know, that, that might be a generation before a change like that occurs. And okay. just to make life complicated, so it'll be simpler later, just remind everybody that we are 10 years, maybe a little bit more, but let's say there are good colleagues at Santec tell us maybe 10 years away from a point where substantial amounts of the parking we're building today will no longer be required not because people aren't still driving and parking, but because cars will park in much less space because they'll park themselves. Uh, the, imp the, 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 the lesson here is when we plan for a development, let's say with a thousand parking spaces that will support two million square feet, plan for the ability to add another million square feet when 40% of that parking structure is empty. So whereas traditionally we planned as if we were creating a fixed state plan, we, this development will be this way for eternity, never actually worked out that way, but we thought that way. Going forward, we need to build in the ability to adapt in terms of adding density and intensification, uh, simply, if nothing else, simply to use the parking that will be available, but also given the incredible uh, urban markets and imperative we have, there will probably be a growing need to do that. Okay, I'm gonna move and I'll uh, speak from experience. I live close to Reston Town Center that recently started charging for parking. Uh, Boston Properties is the developer, and there are, it's, it's actually caused an upheaval in uh, the community and a lot of people who frequent the town center, uh, and there are two lawsuits. And 
now you'll hear any retailer that's leaving Reston Town Center, of course, it's because of the parking, but um, it's a growing issue and, and, you know, for decades and since the beginning, uh, people have been accustomed to that free parking. And as David mentioned, just across the street, there is, you know, some strip development that has that parking that people could actually walk into it for free. But um, yeah, it will be a growing issue, but it's an issue that will fade away as well in, in time. All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, quick question. And maybe this is Sarah. Uh, is there a way to allow property tax abatements without taking money from the school system? Yeah, I mean, certainly there's way. I mean, we, we definitely have done that in certain communities where the school system isn't part of the abatement. You know, they actually take the millage rate and they pull out the school and you don't have the abatement for the school. So, yeah, there are all kinds of ways to do it. And there is real sensitivity always um, about about the schools. But we often... And this is more of an urban thing, but uh, often the product that's being developed is um, it's it's more for households that are one to two people and don't have kids, so that the impact on the schools is really not as um, not as significant as often people's knee jerk reaction is, because they immediately the knee jerk reaction is residential generates school kids, and we are now spending a lot of time sort of looking at the kind of residential that David was talking about in his presentation earlier about, you know, these are not necessarily households that have a lot of kids. So um, there are two ways to approach it. One is really to understand the, the school kid generation, but also there are certainly ways that you can only abate on the non-school millage. Rutgers University publishes, or uh, somebody at Rutgers, and if somebody wants to email, I think you can see my email address on there. I'll be glad to get you, put you in touch with this, with this, the actual information. Uh, it has a wonderful study out that they update annually with that basically uh, uh, is fairly precise about projecting the number of kids associated with various types of new residential development. And this is, they are often, they are a very credible and often very useful source in this discussion. Uh, in Dublin, Terry Folger, the individual I mentioned, brought, went to the school department first before he proposed the TIF and sat down with them and said, let's negotiate so that we meet your needs uh, and you, are, you support us and unlock our ability to create the TIF that will allow us to invest $300 million in, in Bridge Park. And they did this as a partnership. The, the, the details don't matter here, but uh, everybody came out whole. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question, and this will probably be our last question of the day. Uh, if you have cities that might not have, be affluent, uh, but a large population, 100,000 plus, what strategies have you seen cities use to motivate rezoning and reinventing the centers and the approach, uh, in, in, such as enticing developers uh, back to these ideas that usually require more than initial investment? Let me rephrase that. Um, incrementalism. So when you have a community, I know in Suburban Remix, a lot of the case studies we have were more affluent communities, and that's what we're seeing uh, throughout the North America. But how can some of those communities that maybe are not so affluent uh, take an incremental approach in uh, creating walkable urbanism? What are some of the things they need to keep in mind? I can jump in, but Sarah or Chris, do you want to? Okay, I'll jump. Uh, one of the chapters, uh, case studies in Suburban Remix is um, um, Dayton, the Dayton Mall, which is south of Dayton. Dayton is not a growing area. Uh, it is not a high income slice of America. Uh, and uh, the suburbs south of Dayton are, are less so than Dayton. Dayton actually is enjoying a sort of an urban renaissance right now. Uh, we did a plan uh, to redevelop uh, the Dayton Mall 12, actually uh, more than a thousand acres, more than a million square feet over time. It's very much based on incrementalism. And basically, what is unlocking the ability to move that forward is, are two things. One, that even in an area with a declining population, let alone a stable population, the demographic shifts we talked about are happening, and they're happening rapidly and profoundly. So Dayton, no, Dayton the, the county south of Dayton, no growth, yet significant increase in demand for walkable multifamily housing. Uh, and uh, and a market that is underserved, even if the total housing market is literally flat. Uh, so we can have that to tap into. Uh, Dayton, the uh, uh, Miami uh, Township, uh, uh, south of Dayton, developed some very innovative uh, cost-sharing strategies that were basically based on a TIF model uh, to encourage developers to come in and uh, redevelop 
uh, Sarah talked about uh, uh, whenever this new multifamily housing was reached on the ground floor, it was worth more than the dying retail in the uh, in the Dayton Mall area, Greater Mall area. Uh, the county would work with developers to uh, uh, secure control of that property because they could pay more with a tax incentive than the property was currently worth uh, and and move forward. And Sarah, do you want to comment on that? Well, I yeah, I worked on that project, and I one of the things we also looked at is some of the target projects and the near term projects were on Miami Township land. Yeah, yeah, um, you yeah. know, just trying, just being really looking at how do you actually try to make, um, I mean, Lori Voke, as, as um, David mentioned earlier, did the residential market analysis. There was, there was demand. The, you're right, the rents were not super high, but they were, they were higher than the trend. Um, and, um, and so it was really, and so we essentially did a target project that was on uh, Miami Township owned land, and we also had TIF helping, and then we also had we had to surface park it, but it was very incremental and uh, sort of bite size, and and um and that was also acceptable to the shopping center owners, and it was acceptable to the community, which I think is very important, um because not all mall owners are super excited about taking all of their parking lots and making it multifamily housing, <laughs> and that's what they were slightly concerned with, and we didn't do it that way. It was much more strategic. Um, yeah. So I actually think that these kinds of environments are where most of the suburbs are in this country. And and I do think it's just sharpening the pencil and really trying to get the community to agree on a vision and get the right regulatory structure and financing tools to try to make projects work and understanding the market. Yeah. I'd add to that. Uh, I uh, did some work a year or so ago in a California county, uh, you know, similar situation where the downtown is doing well, but the folks out in the county, you know, trying to figure out what to do with a major corridor and, um, you know, it's not performing well. So, you know, to some degree, you have to have some, you know, you have to have something to work with. Um, but I, one of the things that we found that I, I think would, a lot of people would find if they looked at it, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're in a situation where you're kind of marginal and, you know, you don't have the obvious engine of growth that's going to make this easy, one of the things I, I say, every place should do is really look at what it is you are doing because you often find as we found in this case where there are in fact incentives they're using there are tax abatements they're giving and various kinds of things and they're doing them all over the place they're doing them without any connection to actually their policy for growth or economic development and so one of the things you can do is stop doing some of the stuff you're doing don't pay people to go build things in places it's not helpful what you're trying to do is as sarah said start small focus and we have to say this over and over again, focus, focus, focus. 25 to 40 acres is a great size for a catalytic project. If you bring to bear the things that you have, the tools that you actually already have and maybe using in a concentrated place to make something happen, you might be able to you know, get a fire going. So my, my version of focus, focus, focus is critical mass, critical mass, critical mass. Uh, so um, if you're a community that's going to see a thousand housing unit, a thousand units of new housing developed, let's say over 10 years, and that housing using uh, those housing units are scattered across your community. Probably no net new demand for walkable retail anywhere. No net 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 new change or new opportunity to create a walkable center of your community. If you can concentrate those thousand housing units, which is probably what the market would prefer you do. Uh, within a five-minute walk of each other, you can bring a block of Main Street to life and create something and let the market play the major role in creating something transformative for your community. So focus, 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 and, and critical mass, critical mass, critical mass. Jason. We seem to have lost Jason. Jason, are you there? <laughs> yes. They, Jason is the elusive mute button, sorry. Um, okay, so yeah. uh, any closing thoughts uh, from our panelists? We're up against our time, but uh, we have a lot of questions. I do want to reiterate um, that please do feel free to um, reach out to uh, any of the panelists. Uh, you can find David and I on LinkedIn or at our email address or on social media. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Sarah and Chris would be happy to answer some follow-up questions. Uh, so. Uh, if there are no last thoughts, I'd like to thank everybody for joining the webinar, and uh, please look forward to the third installment, uh, which we are anticipating for by, by May sometime on smart suburbs. 
at which time we will address more of the uh, shared autonomous vehicle, uh, autonomous vehicle discussion and the questions that we are receiving. Uh, but once again, thank you very much, and I hope everyone enjoys your day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.